great album. lots of different ways, and you know, I think every, um, I think most, you know, by the time you come to the um, uh, defense, it's a common thing that PhD students have to think about, how are they going to condense everything in one hour of talking, um, and I have worked on very, very diverse things, maybe in part because I have a hard time focusing on a single thing, and um, it occurred to me that there's a whole sort of professional group of people that are really experts at taking ideas that aren't necessarily related and mashing them together and calling them um, a single piece of work, and that is uh, classical composers. <laughs> and uh, you know, they'll take a whole bunch of different ideas and they'll write a bunch of different parts and they'll mash together and call it a sonata or a concerto or a symphony. And the nice thing about that, once it occurred to me, is that they call their separate parts uh, movements. So this is the outline of my talk, <laughs> in sort of a modified sonata form. There's going to be a little overture development. The first movement is complex movement. The second movement is a whimsical movement. Um, a little interlude on scales. Um, a third movement on encounters. A fourth movement is heterogeneous. And there's a media coda. So, um, okay, development. Um, so to these people say that the study of animal movement is fundamentally important to future advances in ecological, ecological evolutionary theory, as well as to applied disciplines such as natural resource management, pest control, public health. And so the nice thing about quotes sometimes is they can sort of, uh, if you find a good one, then you don't have to say add very much to it. I mean, that is basically, and I think for most people in this room, are aware of the sort of centrality of movement. Uh, in ecology and applied fields, and in sort of theoretical basic science sort of questions, um, biological questions. But just go through the motions, you know, all animals and some plants move, um, at least at some stage in their life cycle. Um, and all sorts of ecological processes, foraging, survival, reproduction, uh, migration, invasion, dispersal, aggregation, these are all basically results of movement, movements and encounters. And the other kind of neat thing about movement, um, it's kind of fundamental, is that you can't, you can't ever, usually, uh, measure what's going on inside of an organism's brain. You can sort of infer some processes, but the one thing you can sometimes measure is movement. So that's kind of an output of some sort of internal process. Um, and it's useful for that, potentially. Um, on the other hand, historically, uh, sort of as a science, ecology is a science, that it hasn't necessarily had movement as a very essential um, object of study. Um, it's been more concerned with, uh, I don't know, historically with uh, population levels and species interactions and definitions of habitats and things like that. Um, and that's uh, in part because there hasn't necessarily been good data. Um, that's totally not the case anymore. I mean, here's a slide of just some random movement tracks of different animals, ranging from whales to um, algae. Um, and this is like, this is just like uh, scooping a teacup out of the ocean. I mean, there's so many, so many, so many uh, reports. Every month, probably, there's another like new data set is published. And um, there's tons, just interacting with movement ecologists, there's tons of data that is just lying in databases on movement. And you know, it's a consequence of technology. We can video track better. We can have all these GPS satellite tags out there. Um, we're accumulating a lot of data. And uh, generally, I think it's fair to say that the uh, data is being collected maybe a little bit ahead of the analysis methods. Um, a big question is, yeah, what kind of information is having the data? Um, there's some issues about movement data. It's multi-dimensional. It's usually auto-correlated. It uh, often comes with errors in measurement errors. Um, gappiness, there's irregular intervals in measurement, is a common feature, especially in marine environments. Um, it's uh, heterogeneous in a lot of different ways. We'll talk about that. And there really is mm, a real consensus on appropriate models or um, analysis methods. Um, 
So, um, this is my sort of conceptual model of how um, movement ought to be looked at in a sense. So, if we, you know, we think about an organism um, kind of doing its thing, um, it has uh, some internal states that some of which can be measured, its location can certainly be measured. It's moving around an environment, you know, in this environment there's some food stuff over there and there's something scary over there to the right. And um, it somehow processes all this stuff. Um, that's kind of a black box. Um, and the output is movement. So this is sort of like the fundamental framework. And we can observe something about the environment, something about the state, something about um, the movement, and hopefully maybe infer something about it. And it, this is, I guess, if there's anything in common to what I do, it's that I really try to have an organism-centric sort of approach to looking at these things. Um, so basically, we can say that behavior is a process which transforms the state and the local environment. Um, and so um, the movement itself from an organism-centric point of view, is an orientation and a speed that it chooses. So this is everything we measure. We measure all these positions, we measure the environment at those locations, we measure these turning angles, we sample these little dots, like what we sample, um, and then we output these speeds and these angles. So that's the strategy. Take positions and times of observation, find velocities and turning angles in it, um, then the accessory information and analyze them. Um, so the, the most common, maybe the best sort of approach that's kind of almost standard, um, it's been around for a little while, is this kind of correlated random walk model. Um, where you have, your turning angles are just independent draws from some distribution of angles. Um, which is that first plot on the left. And then your step lengths come from some positive distribution of step lengths. Um, and you know, these are the sorts of things you can get out of a fully random walk. This is a sort of a pure random walk where all the steps are about the same length and the angles are totally random. This is like a very correlated walk. It's a little smoother. Um, and you can estimate these parameters very straightforwardly. Um, the pros are that it's intuitive and it's organism-centric and it's pretty informative and it's easy to implement. There are some issues with the correlated random walk as it is most classically applied and that is that it's in a sense, not truly correlated in that the um, parameters that define the movement, which are these angles and these length steps, are independently drawn. Or people very rarely look at the relationship between subsequent lengths or subsequent angles. And um, that means that it misses important features. So, for example, if you have a very long, if you have a wide arc, you're doing a consistent turn to the right, and as you're turning, your angle, turning angle is constant to the right because it's correlated, then you can't capture a truly consistent wide radius. You can't change radii um, in a correlated random walk. And the other thing about it is that it assumes sort of discrete consistent sampling, which is very rare in actual data. So these are all things that uh, are sort of issues with it and that aren't very well addressed in the literature. Um, so the sort of final unresolved chord of the development is, you know, can we do better? Um, and that brings us to the first movement which is complex.